HBCU in the country. Um, you know, I, yeah, I see that face. <laughs> the best HBCU in the country. Um, and again, I, I, I've known Miss Dorothy. She's known me since I was a wee lad. Uh, we were actually family friends. Um, went to high school with her. Um, so telling her ages a, a little bit, but uh, she, she made the call to invite me. And today I, I want to give you guys a glimpse um, into my research and not just to, um, you know, go over some, some academic, academic terms, but as um, you students and folks are listening to my research, this all came out of an idea that started in my mind. And as you go through it, you know, and I want to, uh, before I get started, I want to want to let everyone know that you all are special. Follow your ideas, follow your dreams, though there, there may be people who are going to deter you from um, pursuing uh, your dreams. You follow those ideas, you know, and what may seem rudimentary to you may be groundbreaking for someone else. So that's my tidbit. So I'm going to... Uh, share my screen. Oh, am I doing this right? Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Hope everyone can see this. Let's do this. Okay. I'm going to start this from the beginning. And again, this is sort of, I'm, I sort of um, I'm going to give you a snippet of my, my dissertation. And what I did, I am a child of hip hop. I am a fan of the culture. Um, and I wanted to do something, not just look at hip hop as, as music, but I really wanted to explore um, the business of hip hop. And when I was, I was talking to Mr. Hassan, it's, it's, you know, I like to think, and it's where, you know, the intersection where Dr. King meets Dr. Dre. So we started out, you know, hip hop, um, you know, it was, it, it's a culture of, we all know what it is, of, of emceeing, breakdancing, graffiti, um, you know, it's a form of expression. Hip hop is, a, people ask me what is hip hop? Hip hop is the authentic expression of someone who's felt left out of disenfranchised. And we do this through our art. Um, you know, I've traveled the world and, you know, when you start looking at, you know, the most disenfranchised or the most suppressed cultures, have a very budding art culture. And it's not my field of research, but someone needs to do some research on that of, you know, these, 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 these cultures around the world that have been, that have been disenfranchised or depressed, and they come up with this beautiful art. And one of these art forms was, you know, came out of New York City. You know, did I invent hip hop? No, but I like to think I was around there. I was there, I was 125 miles away. Um, again, hip hop offers the struggling, uh, offers the, the struggling urban youth an outlet cope with the harsh realities of things. And one, one of the things that I love about hip hop and what lends to this work that I've done is that in hip hop, we never talk about where we are. And when we do talk about it, but it's always a means of getting out. It's, it's never, you know, I'm down in the dumps. You know, we may be down in the dumps, but we're looking to get better. So the background of, of, of my study, um, hip hop classic song, Rapper Delight. And, you know, for those of you who are going deep into the crates and those of you have vinyl records, you know, this is a 14 minute song. It was very popular. Um, but this song, which which really piqued my interest and we didn't realize at the time, is that this song mentions um, over 30 different brands in there from Lincoln Continentals to Cadillacs uh, to Hotel Motel Holiday Inn um, in the course. So this song is sort of what's kicked off, which really piqued my interest. Um, you know, as uh, for this research, you know, hip hop affords itself as a tool for marketing brands because it acts as a conduit for the psyche of the consumer. So again, rap lyrics take you there, you know, and I love those rap lyrics as I was coming up that takes me there, you know, when Tupac was rapping about thug passion, like it took me there. Like I wanted to go there though I was not of age, but I wanted to go there. I wanted to be in that moment. And that's what's special about this culture about hip hop culture that I hold near and dear, that we hold near and dear to our hearts. That not only that those lyrics, you know, the best lyrics take you there in that moment and it can act as a conduit um, for products and services for marketing. No, no, oh, okay, here we go. Okay, so, 
you know, during, when you're doing your research, you got to do a, a, a problem statement. So um, one of the things, and not to go through this, and when I was presenting my research um, to, the, the, to the officials at, at my university, you know, it was around the time that when Jay-Z, you know, released his album Magna Carta, Holy Grail. And what was so monumental about that is that here is this multi-platinum recording artist from Marcy Projects who is now teaming up, not the fact that he put out another great album, but he teamed up with Samsung, a multinational telecommunications company to push his album out exclusively through that platform. I know when it came out on the 4th of July, um, maybe 10 or 11 years ago, and people were scrambling to get Samsung phones to get this album because that was the only way you can listen to it. So if you're a diehard Jay-Z fan, so in my research, I wanted to explore that. I wanted to explore how hip hop and that intersection between hip hop, you know, this artist and these multinational corporations are coming together, whether it's planned, whether it's organically. And again, companies like Coca-Cola and Adidas have been tapping into this for years. And one of the things that as we go through this presentation that you'll realize is that um, one of the things I want you all to, all, all, all of you to walk away with is that you're being marketed to and you don't even know you've been marketed to. Um, and now that now that they see that this intersection that it actually works, there's been marketing firms that and people really, you know, digging into hip hop and how can we push our products and services through this culture. So that was my problem statement that I wanted to I wanted to explore. You know, the purpose of my study, what I did, you know, not to be late, I did a phenomenological study. Um, I really had to zero in. I couldn't do a broad base and I really researched um, multi uh, companies in the beverage industry in the Atlanta market. And that's what I did. So I, I sat down and just after I did my research and I sat down with people from Coca-Cola, Hennessy, Miller Coors, Red Bull, um, Grey Goose, and Ciroc. And it was another company, I may be getting confused, it was over five years ago, but I sat down and that's, what, that's where I pulled my research from. The research question that I, I came up with was, you know, what's the lived experience of companies who have incorporated hip hop culture artists into their marketing strategy? The significance of the study um, is that I wanted to I wanted to tell the story. I wanted to turn the page because up until this point, there was very limited research on hip hop culture. A lot of things, and there's still a lot of things that are out there in hip hop culture deals with you know, the lyrics, the misogyny, the violence, the guns, the, the domestic violence, all the social ills, everyone talked about that, but no one really talked about how this genre that was once written off by the gatekeepers of the music industry is now becoming a force, not just musically, but business-wise, pumping billions and probably going on trillions of dollars not into just the New York economy, not in just the East Coast economy, not to just the West Coast economy, but the entire world has wanted, has come into hip hop and accepted hip hop. So that's why I wanted to sell this. And I had this picture of Muhammad Ali up here. And I wanted to tell this story. There were people who didn't look like me, who were early baby boomers in post world, post -world war generation, who told me that, no, you cannot put this filth, you cannot put this into the body of knowledge. It won't be accepted, no one will do it. And I went back and forth and it took me nine long years to complete my dissertation. And I almost got kicked out of my program. But, um, and those of you who are doctors on here, you know, you get a certain amount of time to complete your dissertation. I was willing to, I was willing to get kicked out of the program. And, you know, it brought me to this Muhammad Ali moment that I, you can take, I will die for what I believe in. Um, that's how passionate I was about this. And, you know, about education, it's about following the truth. So the significance of this was to turn the page to take it, you know, not from the, the ills of hip hop, but let's talk about the money and the people that are benefiting from this. So that was sort of my Muhammad Ali moment. So getting to the good stuff. So we can watch TV and depending on what show you're watching or, or what station you're watching, there's probably, and my research is probably a little bit dated, there's a 60 to 75% chance that the commercials that you're going to see on TV, that those commercials have some element of hip hop culture in it. Um, so I have here Macy's, they have the breakdancing. 
they don't look like me, but they're breakdancing. This is why me and hip hop has been universally accepted. And we all know that, you know, Drake did, Drake has a deal with Sprite and, you know, he does the, uh, you know, he had the whole LeBron James soundtrack movie. Uh, so, you know, Drake is doing that, but you can go through all the time you can see. And again, it's it's articles written about the, 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 the product placement of hip hop, you know, in the videos and the commercials and even people in their everyday lives. Again, you're being marketed to through this genre. You don't even know you're being marketed to. So one of the, uh, and I, this slide also goes back to referencing um, the Sugar Hill Gang, um, you know, as far as the marketing and hip hop. And I'm going to show you guys uh, a, a video, hope it comes up on, on this platform. I tested it five or six times. Um, but along with Rapper's Delight, shortly after that, one of those organic moments, those aha moments uh, in hip hop, you know, is the whole Run DMC and Shell to Adidas. And for those of you who are around in the, in the 80s, the, the, the early to mid 80s, to have Shell to Adidas was the thing. So young folks, don't think that you guys created sneaker culture. Sneaker culture has been around for almost 40 years, okay? And I'm going to show you a video of what I like to deem, and I'm a sneakerhead. I collect Jordans outside of me wearing suits to work every day. I also have 80 pair of retro Jordans. Um, I have various colorways and all those things. So I'm, I'm heavy in the shoe game, and this is why it's near and dear to me. Um, so I'm going to play this. Hopefully it plays. Here we go. And there you have it. That is when a major intersection happened between multinational corporation, multinational, multinational corporation Adidas, that's an Italian company, and these New York based rappers. Now, when you dig further into the research at this concert, Russell Simmons invited the executives, the marketing executives, to Madison Square Garden that night, specifically for them to hear this song. Um, again, something that was being done organically and it was a point of style. Um, it was cool to have no shoelaces in your, in your Adidas or rock them or wear them with the fat laces in there. But they wanted to show like this cultural phenomenon has the ability and the power to sell goods and services. And if you do some more research, you'll see shortly after that, that sort of the, uh, the collaboration between Run DMC and My Adidas, though limited editions, and then when Jam Master J passed away, they put out another edition of that. So again, hip hop has, is now turned into a, a billion dollar industry that has capitalized on international marketing. So that was sort of, in my opinion, one of the jump off points um, for this research. I mean, for what, what I wanted to do, and what I wanted to convey. Again, the significance of this song is that these New York based rappers were talking about standing on 125th street. And for those of you who are been in around New York city and Harlem, um, 125th street, you know, expressing themselves, you know, by their dress, by their fashion, by having these fresh white shell toe Adidas on, on 125th street, which, you know, goes back to, you know, our excellence going back to the Harlem Renaissance era. So that's the significance of this. And I wanted to pull that out and show you folks. One of the things that's important about that sort of that was important in my research is the power of the celebrity endorsement. Um, 
and companies have caught on to this. Um, and it's sort of companies caught on to the celebrity endorsement aspect of it all. And then, you know, hip hop legends such as Jay-Z, Puff Daddy, Diddy, Sean Combs, whatever it's called this week, Russell Simmons, you know, they actually sort of turned away from, you know, these companies to develop their own lines because they realized the power of celebrity endorsements. Now, I put this slide here for you young folks here. I'm not going to read the words on here. But this shirt that you see with this sewing on Muppet is a denim uh, Louis Vuitton shirt. And the other, if you can see close up, the other picture of the young man on there, that's a picture of Young Thug. Now, Young Thug, I don't follow him on social media, but apparently Young Thugger, that's what you guys call him, Young Thugger had this shirt on, which I would never wear this shirt, but now this shirt is now sold out all over the place. This shirt's $1,000, I would never wear, but it just shows you the power of celebrity endorsement, okay? Young Thug does not have a deal with uh, Louis Vuitton, but because he put this shirt on that Jim Henson produced back in uh, 1984, now this shirt has been sold out. So it just shows you the power of celebrity endorsements. And we see these things, um, you know, not straight away from, from, from hip hop, but the Kardashians. And you see this with, with Beyonce and Ivy Park. And we can go down a list. Uh, we see this with, with Puff Daddy and Ciroc, you know, so the power of celebrity endorsements, you know, and, you know, prior to hip hop coming along, you know, we thought we had to have this astute, you know, man or woman who, 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 you know, has a mastery of the king's language to promote products. But the authentic expression of hip hop has sort of turned all that on its head. And now we've become the trendsetters. We're going to talk about that in, in a few more slides going down. So we're talking about, you know, we watch now. I was growing up, and for those of you who are, in their 40s, you know, you, you, you know, if you had a cable box, if you didn't have a cable box, you know, we used to be glued to our TVs watching music videos. I watched TRL, I watched BET's Countdown with Donnie Simpson, Sherry Carter, Rap City The Basement. Um, as I got older, BET Uncut, I was always glued to the TV. You can still find me now if nothing's on TV. I'm going to watch Revolt TV and I'm just going to sit down and watch music videos. One of the things that made, you know, hip hop and marketing very powerful was the music videos. What are you going to see? What are they going to be wearing? What are they going to be drinking? What are they going to be driving? Where are they going to be vacationing? What are they going to be doing? Hip hop artists found out that they can sort of control the narrative. They can, they can push the trends out by putting things in their music videos. So, you know, if you watch the MTV Video Music Awards or, you know, when video, when music videos really became popular, it was like, how much money can we spend on this music video? Who can we get to direct it? You know, music video became like sort of mini movies, special effects, pyrotechnics, all these things in there, cars. So the music videos, you know, you see that the alcohol, the jewelry, all these things sort of affected, you know, hip hop and marketing. So, you know, I got this picture here, you know, they had to show Pet My Ride, you know, and now you have Quavo, which I think he's sitting on a, a Lotus or one of those cars that I can't afford. Um, so it just shows then and now, but the evolution of the hip hop consumption, um, the consumption imagery of hip hop and how it plays a role in hip hop marketing. Again, I'll stress this to you young folks, you're being marketed to and you don't even know it. And sometimes it's planned, sometimes it's organic, we got to scratch it a little bit beneath the surface to figure out which one it is. So one of the things that, and I don't have any pictures associated with this slide, and one of the one of the points that I wanted to talk to you guys about is hip hop consumption, and there have been Veblen sort of uh, in 1899, and someone did a rewrite of this in 1994, which talks about conspicuous consumptions and conspicuous consumption to sort of simplify it. Let's think of the Trump tax cuts and what they were designed to do. Now, I, don't, I didn't support those tax cuts, but what they said is that if we cut taxes for the rich, that money will trickle down to the middle and lower class, and they will also, you know, those boats will rise. This, the tide will raise those boats as well. And we know, depending on what side of the aisle you sit on, some people may think it's true, some people may think it's false. We're not going to go there. But in 2004, Smith sort of... Um, sort of addressed this and, and sort of hip hop 
has sort of inverted just this, this conspicuous consumption theory. And, and again, we're not in the classroom. If, if the cameras are on, I would ask everyone to raise their hands. Of How many people out there think that in their lifetime, they started a trend or started a style, they were responsible for a saying or a lingo or the way someone did their hair, the way they wore their jeans or the way they wore their sneakers, the way they cuffed something, 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 something. Smith says hip hop culture is sort of flipped Veblen's conspicuous consumption on its head, meaning that hip hop is from the streets, it's from the people. And now these styles and trends come from the people. And it's a complete uh, disagreement of what was said in 1899. And we know this to be true now because the things that are said in these songs are done in these videos. Now we can see them play out and Again, New York City, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Chicago, LA, these places where you know these megastars have come from, they have now set the trends and they push out what people are going to be buying. They push out what people are going to be driving. They push out what type of jewelry people are going to be buying. Like I have a grill, you know, I love wearing a grill because I, I live in the South. So again, we are the ones who set those trends, not the upper class. So as you go through life, and again, don't be afraid of your own greatness. If you think something is good, you could become a tastemaker as well. So I wanted to drive that point home to folks. So again, going back to um, hip hop and marketing, there, there's been some, some other examples out there. Um, again, it's just, that it's just not in you know luxury cars and things like that. Here's some examples of our guy right here, the Pillsbury Doughboy. And uh, we'll uh, see how Pillsbury has incorporated uh, hip hop in its own uh, advertisements as well. Uh, here's a wrap that you should know, made with Pillsbury crescent rolls. Just wrap a wiener filled with cheese. Pick it up. Be sure to please. The Doughboy wrap. And there you have it. And then if we go back in to this as well, again, that's. We never thought of crescent rolls, but again, back in the, in the early '90s, you know, Pillsbury, uh, Pillsbury Company decided to try and wrap out. I used to like that commercial, like to watch it as well. Here's another commercial of a software company leveraging hip hop culture as well um, in their advertisements. I got my whole life in this thing. Check out this new song I'm mixing. Still rough. Well, I say that. Got the new uh, Rock Aware campaign. Shot it in Aspen. Big's kind of cool. Love playing chess online. Hold on. This game is over. I wonder if he knows. Vacation photos you won't see in the tabloids. Uh, new Frank Gary plans for my team in Brooklyn. See that? Cool. Just start organizing my world tour. Trying to be a rock star and a role model. Got to track all my investments because I'm retired, right? <laughs> my passport says Sean, but you may know me by another name. How? HP Pavilion Entertainment Notebooks with Intel Centrino Dual Mobile Technology. The computer is personal again. So those two, those two ads just just show how. Other companies have been incorporating hip hop um, and not to go too deep into this. Um, you know, when Puff Daddy put out the song, Pastor Cavassier, um, sales of Cavassier rose 60% worldwide just off that one song. So there's some magic in that. And again, they didn't have, uh, when Puff Daddy and Pharrell did that song, Ciroc wasn't even around then. And it was through songs like that that created those entrepreneurial adventures. Now we see Jay-Z is into a lot of different things. You know, he, he has, he, you know, he has his streaming stuff. He's, he's partnered with the NFL. Uh, you know, he has his new cannabis line that's out in, in, in California. So he's in a lot of different things. But hip hop artists are now realizing their own power and own abilities to wield products and services and use their own celebrity and to keep most of the profits for themselves. Again, um, we talk about product placement in videos. Uh, when you look at, 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 at you know, Kanye West, um, you know, he mentions 
Uh, and that first, his first album, College Dropout, he mentioned um, he mentioned 19 different brands in the song. Um, all go when it all goes down, talks about Toys R Us, Avis, and Lexus. And because of that, I'm not a fan of of, of Adidas. But now we know he has a sneaker, the sneaker uh, brand where he has the collaboration with Adidas right now with the Yeezus. Uh, more power to if you wear those things. Um, if you think about Hennessy, if you guys have parents out there, you see people drinking Hennessy. Um, there is, uh, it's it's not a secret uh, why um, Hennessy is a, is a heavily consumed product in the African American community. Um, again, this is a little bit dated, but you know Hennessy was mentioned um, 47 times in songs that cracked the Billboard top 20. Um, it's coming close second to Cadillac. So these brands that we just think they're just there. Again, we've been marketed to without even being known that we've been marketing to for years. And now brands like uh, Hennessy or Cadillac are staples. And I know are staples in the African-American community. Again, the brain has to hear or see something um, over 20 different times, see or hear it 20 different times for a register. So just imagine how many times um, you know you hear the word Hennessy in a song, or you know, it may not be Cadillac, or it could be you know a Lambo or, or or Escalade or something along those lines. So again, the product placement, the lyrical content, you're being marketed to, and not even knowing you're being marketed to. So again, listen to the lyrics that you that you that you uh, make sure that you're not just hearing the lyrics, that you're listening to the lyrics that's coming through your ears. Well, one of the things in my in my research that I, you know, when I ask my research questions, um, and I ask ask those those folks in those seven companies to define hip hop culture, and I did a qualitative study and I used word clouds through in vivo ten, not to get too technical, but when I interviewed the folks, the software that I used, it synthesized the data and pulled out the key words that folks were using. So we asked people you know, what's your definition of hip hop? And you can see lifestyle, you can see music, you can see dressing, you can see clothing, uh, you see uh, uh, evolve, uh, you see, uh, you know, some things around here, graffiti, you see dance, you see world, you see experience, you see sports. When you ask people what their definition of hip hop, these are the words that came out. My second research question was, what's your experience of hip hop culture? People, brands, music, video, experience, cool, college, entertainment, marketing, Timberlands, Drake, Nas. You know, you see all these words in these clouds, you know, when people start defining what their own defini definition of hip hop is. You know, when I asked them what are the factors that made their companies interested in, in pursuing hip hop culture and their marketing strategy, the brand, the music, the target. It was cool. I hope that you guys are seeing that music brand and cool are also in the same in the other in the previous other word clouds as well. Uh, consumers, Sprite, integration, spend, beverage, data, all these words that sort of count come out um, in the research of why companies decided to do it. Um, when we asked them, you know, what elements of hip hop culture has your organization incorporated in marketing strategy? Overwhelmingly, it was the show. And for those of you who have been to concerts, I remember um, they have Atlanta One Music Fest and it goes on during the summer. It's outdoor concert. Hopefully we can go back, go back to having outdoor concerts and indoor concerts soon um, after we get past this pandemic. But at the hottest point, it was Red Bull was one of the top sponsors. At the hottest point of the day, around 4.30 in the middle of the summertime, everyone's out there. You see the Red Bull promotional team, and this is right before Wu-Tang Clan went on stage. The Red Bull promotional team was going around the entire crowd at 4 p.m., the hottest day, handing out free Red Bulls to people. I felt like that was ingenious because it associated with, I'm hot, I'm tired, Red Bull gives you wings, it's going to quench your thirst. Again, they used that element of the show and the speakers and the stage all had the Red Bull banners on there, but they also used their product. They gave their product away um, at these concerts, uh, which I felt was ingenious uh, to do at the time. So 
Um, again, what elements was the show? Athletes is in there, touring, events, influencers, raps, commercials, um, executives, advertising. These are the words that came out of, of how they've incorporated hip hop culture. Snoop Dogg was a big one as well, how they incorporate hip hop culture in their marketing strategy. Um, when we asked, um, you know, how do they, you know, want to incorporate, how do they, how do they want to incorporate, uh, how they plan to incorporate hip hop culture uh, into their marketing strategy? Again, influence, brand, fans. Oh, look, there's that word again. Hennessy, Nas, Celebrity, uh, Notorious B.I.G. So you can kind of see the words that they use in this. And when we asked them, um, you know, you know, what role did the hip hop culture play in, in, in developing this marketing strategy? It's not that these companies are doing it. They're actually bringing in these artists to help craft their marketing strategy. The word was developing, supporting, they had a role. Um, Nas showed up in there again, because Nas has a very big role in how Hennessy is placed in hip hop. Um, you know, so you can kind of see, you know, how, how they're being used, but the major role that they all talked about is, not only did they just partner, just use their face and their lyrics, they also brought them in of got, gotten their consultation on how they're gonna push that out. Again, you know, how they're gonna incorporate it? Again, shows, festivals, playing. So those are the two big things that came out of how they're gonna be incorporating hip hop culture um, into their marketing strategy. And what's the overall impact of incorporating, uh, you know, hip hop culture and marketing strategy? They want to push the brand. Overwhelmingly, you see brand. They wanted to move. They wanted to push that brand out there. They wanted more sales. They wanted more shelf space in the stores. They wanted more points of sales. So you can kind of see how it all played out. And when I did a sort of a, a sort of an overall. Um, in my chapter five of my research, what I did, um, you know, this is sort of a summation of all the word clouds that you saw. Um, again, music, brand, festival, shows, influencers were the major things. This was sort of the significant part of my findings. And um, again, this, this study just showed how, you know, hip hop culture is a viable means to develop a deeper connection with their customers. Hip hop culture served as uh, uh, internal organic marketing department for a lot of not just beverage companies, but companies as a whole um, through the lyrical content, the live performances, the video placements. Um, that was the sort of you know, implications of the study. Um, again, in further research. So if anyone, I put this slide here, you know, when you're working on your, if you decide to work on your doctor degree, it's something that you want to do. Um, by all means, you can Google Jamar Jeffers and you can continue my research and like, hey, I want to do this in the automobile industry or I want to do this in the clothing industry or you want to do it in any industry, you know, you can also go in and duplicate my study. It'd be very flattering if anyone did that. But I want to keep this in here to let you know that it doesn't just start with me. It can keep moving on. Um, so I am going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, is there any questions? I know I just gave you guys a lot of information, um, and I wanted to make sure I was I was I was um, you know effective with my time. But any 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 questions or anything uh, about the research? I know we have some some things in the chat. Well, hi, I'm I'm back. I was having a problem with my computer, of course, um, and I'm still trying to share my video, but that's okay. Um, I just want to comment on just how relevant um, and everything your research is even now. And I had placed a, um, a comment in the chat box. Uh, I, I, I thought you were here, but you're not. So just to know that here in the Columbus area, that is so prevalent with the Kroger commercial that's using Flo Rida's low, low. Yeah, 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 yeah. Low, 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 low. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that is very popular, and that cross so that crosses all genres. That goes from just the hip hop culture to grandma sitting watching TV and thinking, "Oh yeah, I need some apples." Yeah, yeah. Again, th this idea um, again for the students that are on here, 
you know, I'm nobody special. And, you know, I meant to tell you guys this in the beginning of my, my uh, before I presented, I'm nobody special in, 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 in Didi. I'm sorry, Dorothy. <laughs> Mr. Sign knows this. I'm a kid from Wilmington, Delaware. Um, I graduated high school with a 1.8 GPA and I scored a 630 total in the SAT. That was my total. That was my highest score. Um, I got accepted to Delaware State on academic probation. Um, again, I'm, I'm nobody special. Um, but I tell that story is that anything is possible. Um, you know, you control your own destiny, you write your own ticket, you write your own story. Um, whether you decide to go to a, a four-year school or two-year school or take up a trade, um, but I can tell you that by furthering your education, you know, I took something that I intersected art with business. Um, and with something that just came out of my mind because I realized that everything that Jay-Z was rapping about, I was trying to put my hands on. Even when he started talking about Armadale Vodka or Belvedere Vodka, I remember being an undergrad, I wanted to buy that, you know, from Rockaway or various cars and the way, the way I dressed and all those things. So, you know, that was sort of my aha moment. And as I went further into my educational um, career, you know, the farther you go in education, you can study whatever you want, but you got to make it make sense. Um, you have to tie it back in. Um, so, you know, I tell you that story um, that the sky is the limit. Um, so if there's an idea, if there's a dream, if there's anything out there that you want to pursue, um, you know, pursue the excellence, you know, just, just do it. You know, like Nike says, just do it. Don't let anything hold you back from doing that. I'm like, I'm nobody special. I'm a kid from Wilmington, Delaware. I'm silly. Uh, uh, people still call me goofy as an adult. Like I'm no one special. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you folks and, uh, Mrs. Hassan smiling because she, she knows me as a my years of a misspent youth. <laughs> Any questions? I, I, would, I would never agree to that extent, but um, I am happy and, and again, thankful that you took your time out because I think this is important again, um, as we talk about our conversation with black history, because I think it's important to know what is being shoved down everyone's throats. And it's just a beautiful oxymoron that what we started in, you know, in a step in New York City is being shoved down our throats. And that uh, is not always in, with the intention of our empowerment. So we have to be careful and know what, what is being sold what's be to buy it. If we agree to participate in that, then at least know, at least know what you're signing up for. And this is again, just really important because the youth that we are serving and the youth that we are dealing with, this is what they're listening to. This is how they are living their lives. Um, I'm looking, the only person who has their camera on is Bakar. And he looks like, I hope that I know already what he looks like when he wants to say something. And I feel like it's, it's at his throat. So Bakar, go, go I want, spit. I want to, hold on Bakar before you speak. I wanted to, when I was taking, um, I remember taking some media, um, uh, my major at Delaware State, my undergrad major was mass communications with emphasis in public relations. And Mr. Dwayne Wickham, um, who's a renowned journalist, he has the School of Journalism at Morgan State University. Um, he's wrote books like Bill Clinton and Black America. Um, he's NABJ Journalist of the Year multiple times, and he was our professor in that class. And one of the things that he talked about, speaking with you, uh, Mr. Sean, um, being a critical consumer of your media. You folks are going to be at the age where you have to be careful of the things that goes in these ears and what these eyes see and what comes out of your mouth. Um, so... You know, it is very important that the lyrics that you listen to, that you don't, don't all the way internalize them and take them for face value. Um, just know that it's all entertainment. And, you know, those 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 records that they have about violence and shooting, like you got to be careful of those things. And those, especially those really dark lyrics. I think we were coming up. I mean, it was like a lot of gangbanging stuff. But even as things went, went along, this is even for the death of Tupac and Biggie. Dr. Dre said, like, it is all entertainment. Do not take this stuff to heart. And now you see a lot of hip hop artists becoming more socially responsible 
of what they're putting out there, but some haven't, you know, that trend hasn't gone on, gone all the way throughout the culture. So so young ones, please be careful about what you're consuming. Be a critical consumer of your media and not just with your music, what you are reading, um, what you're watching on TV, what news stations you're watching, all these things can affect the way our decision-making and the way we move forward. Bakar, go. Good afternoon, and that was definitely well spoken, Jamar. Thank you so much for bringing up those points. I know, Dorothy, I uh, briefly uh, left the meeting uh, for that call I took, but if you could just refresh me on what you guys were discussing as far as the topic, and I could definitely chime in on uh, what we're uh, talking about, so. I think you're on mute, Dorothy. Just the importance of making sure, uh, Dr. Jeffers just summed it up, is that everybody has to be careful of, about what they're putting in, what they're taking in. So as much as we as educators, as social change agents, we are um, watching our, our youth, our children, the children in our homes take in stuff, we have that same power to be putting something in. So while we have that audience, while we have the power of uh, being a visual representation and giving uh, them things to read, as Nadine said, literature and um, even the music I play when it's you know seat work time, I I play A Train, I play John Coltrane. That's what that's what you're gonna hear in my classroom, and you because I'm going to force you just like Kroger and just like everybody else on TV is forcing you to shazam, do people still shazam? To shazam yeah. that sound, you're gonna shazam that sound and you're gonna find out, oh my goodness, that's John Coltrane. Oh, this is jazz. Oh, so we also, as social a um, change agents and uh, educators, we have to make sure that we're doing our homework on our end and, and, and be responsible for what we are putting in between those ears. And I always like to say, it goes in between two ears, but it eventually ends up at a soul. So we're we're dealing with souls, and I know that makes it really critical. But that's that's the that's how serious I think it is. Of course, that's an excellent point. You, um, I'm gonna piggyback off of something you just said because um, when I was teaching my kids, and I just this just came up in a memory today on my Facebook. Uh, I was teaching something on a Harlem Renaissance, and I played Minnie the Moocher. And my little sixth graders actually already knew the Heidi Hole parts, but still just to hear them at the top of their lungs do the Heidi Hole parts, it was, it was really cool. We're open. Anybody can unmute, anybody can, anybody yeah. can share. But definitely, uh, Dorothy, yeah, now that I'm familiar with the topic, I definitely agree with that 100%. I mean, like, I feel like, you know, you're obviously a product of, you know, what you consume. And I think, especially for myself growing up, you know, in, in today's pop culture and music and, and that influence, I feel like it's crazy. Like the, the influence that we have over, uh, you know, the culture, I feel like when it comes to music and everything. And I have family that, you know, it's international across the world and, and they know how strong American pop culture is when it comes to the music and to the trends and everything. And so um, I forget the report or where I read it from, but, you know, um, a lot of psychologists talk about how powerful um, the influence of, of, you know, music and things of that nature is, you know what I mean? So if you put on, you know, the new, you know, the new uh, Drake or Push IC or, you know, whatever you're listening to, you know, that's talking about, you know, X, Y, and Z, I feel like, you know, it's obviously got to, you know, influence you to want to be like that, you know what I mean? So um, I don't know. I think, I think myself, what I do is I really love uh, listening to podcasts and talks, you know, of influential people. And I think, you know, Obviously, whatever uh, Bill Gates or whoever is listening to, you know, whatever they're consuming, it's something that's going to be beneficial to them, you know what I mean? So I think, you know, I, I definitely myself, you know, to self-reflect, I, you know, try to pay attention to what I'm consuming and, you know, I try to, you know, listen to things that are beneficial towards me and, and, and things that are going towards my personal development spiritually and mentally and, and all of that good stuff. So I, I definitely, you know, agree with those points and, and, and love this topic, so. Well, one of the things I wanted to, and I didn't want to get too deep into my research and make it like seem like we're sitting in a college classroom, but there's always been a direct relationship between music and marketing. When you go to the mall to go shopping, there's always music playing. <laughs> no, you know, I go to nursery to get, you know, pick up some cologne. There's someone in there playing the piano. Right? <laughs> exactly. You know, think about every single 
insurance company, every commercial has a jingle. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You know, you're in good hands with all state. You know, you know, farmers, all of them have the insurance companies all have a jingle. And that's like embedded into our heads. And the, everyone's nodding in agreement because there's always been this relationship with music and marketing. Um, I think the phenomenon of this is like no one ever expected hip hop to do what it did because they try to write it off. Um, but there's always been this relationship between music and marketing. There's elevator music. There's music playing in the grocery store when you go shopping. If you listen, if it's not too noisy in there, you know, when you go to the mall, there's music pumping in places. Like when you're spending money, there's music playing. When you think about buying something, there's music being played. There's music at the car dealerships. So everywhere there is an exchange of commerce for goods, there's music playing. There is a direct correlation in a relationship with music and marketing. And that's what makes this powerful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffers, we thank you very much. Um, young people who are here, social change agents, uh, I challenge you after this to um, see how you are making sure that the youth that are listening to you, to that the audience that you have, um, just remember that you are very much responsible for what you're encouraging them to put in. So again, we, we, our organization, educate, protect, empower, make sure that you're giving them something that's worth something. And in the end, even if you're not giving them something that's worth something, let them know the message and the intention behind what they're letting other people put in. You know, if you're going to, if you, if you're going to be young, and you listen to Jay-Z, I'm East Coast. If you're going to be list young and listen to Jay-Z, allow the music to take a journey with you uh, or, or encourage your students to do that because it always happens. Art is an expression of, of time and self. So you'll see that so many of these rappers that they listen to, they started at one place where they were talking about um, when they didn't have food and when they were poor and when they slept in the car. And then you'll see that two, two, image, two records in, they got a little money. And now they're talking about vacationing somewhere that you cannot vacation to. <laughs> so we have to let the youth know and, and be mindful of that. Zubeda mentions here the recent usage of hip hop and R&B music used in the transition between programs or commercials in, on NPR. So true. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jeffers. And yeah, and that's, that is the, the, the bomb. That is the total bomb that ever since Black Lives Matter um, became more, uh, the voice became louder. The voice was always there. Ever since the voice became louder and ever since um, people, Black people have started the cancel culture, it's Black people everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Really, and it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. And when I watched Mr. Jangles, which was the Christmas movie on Netflix, and they had Afro beats, they had an Afro beats breakdown in the in the um, in the middle of the the movie. I said, "How how starved were we that we allow public media to?" starve us of this beautiful diversity. So let's be mindful to Jeffrey so much, guys. We have another seven, eight, nine, ten, seven minutes break. And then we will be joined by, sorry, that was my internet. And then we will actually be joined by our executive director. Please don't miss because um, you, you've got to hear what we've been doing. You've got to hear what we're trying to do. And um, hopefully you'll be challenged and you'll find where you can fit into this uh, small impact that we are trying to make. Thank you again so much guys. Enjoy your seven minute break.